There are many great one-liners. Probably the most memorable is, show me the money. But there is one line I thought most truthful. It comes from the scene where Tom Cruise is leaving the firm. He has just been fired, and he is asking the entire company, who wants to come with me? And the whole place is silent and frozen. Only one woman speaks up and says, I'd like to, but I'm due for a promotion in three months. That statement is probably the most truthful statement in the whole movie. It is the type of statement that people use to keep themselves busy, working away to pay bills. I know my educated dad looked forward to his pay raise every year, and every year he was disappointed. So he would go back to school to earn more qualifications so he could get another raise. Then, once again, there would be another disappointment. The question I often ask people is, where is this daily activity taking you? Just like the little hamster, I wonder if people look at where their hard work is taking them. What does the future hold? In his book, The Retirement Myth, Craig S. Carpel writes, I visited the headquarters of a major national pension consulting firm and met with a managing director who specializes in designing lush retirement plans for top management. When I asked her what people who don't have corner offices will be able to expect in the way of pension income, she said with a confident smile, the silver bullet. What, I asked, is the silver bullet? She shrugged and said, if baby boomers discover they don't have enough money to live on when they're older, they can always blow their brains out. Carpel goes on to explain the difference between the old defined benefit retirement plans and the new 401k plans that are riskier. It is not a pretty picture for most people working today, and that is just for retirement. Add medical fees and long-term nursing home care, and the picture is frightening. Already, many hospitals and countries with socialized medicine need to make tough decisions such as who will live and who will die. They make those decisions purely on how much money they have and how old the patients are. If the patient is old, they often will give the medical care to someone younger. The older, poor patient gets put to the back of the line. Just as the rich can afford better education, the rich will be able to keep themselves alive, while those who have little wealth will die. So, I wonder, are workers looking into the future or just until their next paycheck, never questioning where they are headed? When I speak to adults who want to earn more money, I always recommend the same thing. I suggest taking a long view of their life. Instead of simply working for the money and security, which I admit are important, I suggest they take a second job that will teach them a second skill. Often I recommend joining a network marketing company, also called multi-level marketing, if they want to learn sales skills. Some of these companies have excellent training programs that help people get over their fear of failure and rejection, which are the main reasons people are unsuccessful. Education is more valuable than money in the long run. When I offer this suggestion, I often hear in response, oh, that is too much hassle, or I only want to do what I am interested in. If they say, it's too much of a hassle, I ask, so you would rather work all your life giving 50% of what you earn to the government? If they tell me, I only do what I am interested in, I say, I'm not interested in going to the gym, but I go because I want to feel better and live longer. Unfortunately, there is some truth to the old statement, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Unless a person is used to changing, it's hard to change. But for those of you who might be on the fence when it comes to the idea of working to learn something new, I offer this word of encouragement. Life is much like going to the gym. The most painful part is deciding to go. Once you get past that, it's easy. There have been many days I have dreaded going to the gym, but once I am there and in motion, it is a pleasure.
After the workout is over, I am always glad I talked myself into going. If you are unwilling to work to learn something new and instead insist on becoming highly specialized within your field, make sure the company you work for is unionized. Labor unions are designed to protect specialists. My educated dad, after falling from grace with the governor, became the head of the teachers union in Hawaii. He told me that it was the hardest job he ever held. My rich dad, on the other hand, spent his life doing his best to keep his companies from becoming unionized. He was successful. Although the unions came close, Rich Dad was always able to fight them off. Personally, I take no sides because I can see the need for and the benefits of both sides. If you do as school recommends, become highly specialized, then seek union protection. For example, had I continued with my flying career, I would have sought a company that had a strong pilot's union. Why? Because my life would be dedicated to learning a skill that was valuable in only one industry. If I were pushed out of that industry, my life's skills would not be as valuable to another industry. A displaced senior pilot with 100,000 hours of heavy airline transport time, earning $150,000 a year, would have a hard time finding an equivalent high-paying job teaching in school. Skills do not necessarily transfer from industry to industry. Skills the pilots are paid for in the airline industry are not as important in, say, the school system. The same is true even for doctors today. With all the changes in medicine, many medical specialists are needing to conform to medical organizations such as HMOs. School teachers definitely need to be union members. Today in America, the teachers union is the largest and the richest labor union of all. The NEA, the National Education Association, has tremendous political clout. Teachers need the protection of their union because their skills are also of limited value to an industry outside of education. So the rule of thumb is highly specialized, then unionize. It's the smart thing to do. When I ask the classes I teach, how many of you can cook a better hamburger than McDonald's, almost all the students raise their hands. I then ask, so if most of you can cook a better hamburger, how come McDonald's makes more money than you? The answer is obvious. McDonald's is excellent at business systems. The reason so many talented people are poor is because they focus on building a better hamburger and know little to nothing about business systems. A friend of mine in Hawaii is a great artist. He makes a sizable amount of money. One day, his mother's attorney called to tell him that she had left him $35,000. That is what was left of her estate after the attorney and the government took their shares. Immediately, he saw an opportunity to increase his business by using some of this money to advertise. Two months later, his first four-color full-page ad appeared in an expensive magazine that targeted the very rich. The ad ran for three months. He received no replies from the ad, and all of his inheritance is now gone. He now wants to sue the magazine for misrepresentation. This is a common case of someone who can build a beautiful hamburger, but knows little about business. When I asked him what he learned, his only reply was, advertising salespeople are crooks. I then asked him if he would be willing to take a course in sales and a course in direct marketing. His reply, I don't have the time, and I don't want to waste my money. The world is filled with talented poor people. All too often, they're poor or struggle financially or earn less than they are capable of, not because of what they know, but because of what they do not know. They focus on perfecting their skills at building a better hamburger rather than the skills of selling and delivering the hamburger. Maybe McDonald's does not make the best hamburger, but they are the best at selling and delivering a basic average burger. Poor Dad wanted me to specialize. That was his view on how to be paid more.
Even after being told by the governor of Hawaii that he could no longer work in state government, my educated dad continued to encourage me to get specialized. Educated dad then took up the cause of the teachers union, campaigning for further protection and benefits for these highly skilled and educated professionals. We argued often, but I know he never agreed that over-specialization is what caused the need for union protection. He never understood that the more specialized you become, the more you are trapped and dependent on that specialty. Rich Dad advised that Mike and I groom ourselves. Many corporations do the same thing. They find a young, bright student just out of business school and begin grooming that person to someday take over the company. So these bright young employees do not specialize in one department. They are moved from department to department to learn all the aspects of business systems. The rich often groom their children or the children of others. By doing so, their children gain an overall knowledge of the operations of the business and how the various departments interrelate. For the World War II generation, it was considered bad to skip from company to company. Today, it is considered smart. Since people will skip from company to company rather than seek greater specialization in skills, why not seek to learn more than to earn? In the short term, it may earn you less but it will pay dividends in the long term. The main management skills needed for success are 1. Management of cash flow 2. Management of systems 3. Management of people The most important specialized skills are sales and marketing. The ability to sell, to communicate to another human being, be it a customer, employee, boss, spouse, or child, is the base skill of personal success. Communication skills such as writing, speaking, and negotiating are crucial to a life of success. These are skills I work on constantly, attending courses or buying educational resources to expand my knowledge. As I have mentioned, my educated dad worked harder and harder the more competent he became. He also became more trapped the more specialized he got. Although his salary went up, his choices diminished. Soon after he was locked out of government work, he found out how vulnerable he really was professionally. It is like professional athletes who suddenly are injured or are too old to play. Their once high-paying position is gone, and they have limited skills to fall back on. I think that is why my educated dad sided so much with the unions after that. He realized how much a union would have benefited him. Rich Dad encouraged Mike and me to know a little about a lot. He encouraged us to work with people smarter than we were and to bring smart people together to work as a team. Today, it would be called a synergy of professional specialties. Today, I meet ex-school teachers earning hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. They earn that much because they have specialized skills in their field as well as other skills. They can teach as well as sell and market. I know of no other skills to be more important than selling and marketing. The skills of selling and marketing are difficult for most people, primarily due to their fear of rejection. The better you are at communicating, negotiating, and handling your fear of rejection, the easier life is. Just as I advise that newspaper writer who wanted to become a best-selling author, I advise anyone else today. Being technically specialized has its strengths as well as its weaknesses. I have friends who are geniuses, but they cannot communicate effectively with other human beings and, as a result, their earnings are pitiful. I advise them to just spend a year learning to sell. Even if they earn nothing, their communication skills will improve, and that is priceless. In addition to being good learners, sellers, and marketers, we need to be good teachers as well as good students. To be truly rich, we need to be able to give as well as to receive. In cases of financial or professional struggle, there is often a lack of giving and receiving. I know many people who are poor because they are neither good students nor good teachers. Both of my dads were generous men. 
both made it a practice to give first. Teaching was one of their ways of giving. The more they gave, the more they received. One glaring difference was in the giving of money. My rich dad gave lots of money away. He gave to his church, to charities, and to his foundation. He knew that to receive money, you had to give money. Giving money is the secret to most great wealthy families. That is why there are organizations like the Rockefeller Foundation and the Ford Foundation. These are organizations designed to take their wealth and increase it, as well as give it away in perpetuity. My educated dad always said, when I have some extra money, I'll give it. The problem was that there was never any extra. So he worked harder to draw more money in rather than focus on the most important law of money. Give and you shall receive. Instead, he believed in receive and then you give. In conclusion, I became both dads. One part of me is a hardcore capitalist who loves the game of money making money. The other part is a socially responsible teacher who is deeply concerned with this ever-widening gap between the haves and have-nots. I personally hold the archaic educational system primarily responsible for this growing gap. Chapter 7. Overcoming Obstacles The primary difference between a rich person and a poor person is how they manage fear. Once people have studied and become financially literate, they may still face roadblocks to becoming financially independent. There are five main reasons why financially literate people may still not develop abundant asset columns that could produce a large cash flow. The five reasons are, one, fear, two, cynicism, three, laziness, four, bad habits, five, arrogance. Overcoming Fear I have never met anyone who really likes losing money. And in all my years, I have never met a rich person who has never lost money. But I have met a lot of poor people who have never lost a dime. Investing, that is. The fear of losing money is real. Everyone has it, even the rich. But it's not having fear that is the problem. It's how you handle fear. It's how you handle losing. It's how you handle failure that makes the difference in one's life. The primary difference between a rich person and a poor person is how they manage that fear. It's okay to be fearful. It's okay to be a coward when it comes to money. You can still be rich. We're all heroes at something and cowards at something else. My friend's wife is an emergency room nurse. When she sees blood, she flies into action. When I mention investing, she runs away. When I see blood, I don't run. I pass out. My rich dad understood phobias about money. Some people are terrified of snakes. Some people are terrified about losing money. Both are phobias, he would say. So his solution to the phobia of losing money was this little rhyme. If you hate risk and worry, start early. If you start young, it's easier to be rich. I won't go into it here, but there is a staggering difference between a person who starts investing at age 20 versus age 30. The purchase of Manhattan Island is said to be one of the greatest bargains of all time. New York was purchased for $24 in trinkets and beads. Yet, if that $24 had been invested at 8% annually, that $24 would have been worth more than $28 trillion by 1995. Manhattan could be repurchased with money left over to buy much of Los Angeles. But what if you don't have much time left or would like to retire early? How do you handle the fear of losing money? My poor dad did nothing. He simply avoided the issue, refusing to discuss the subject. My rich dad, on the other hand, recommended that I think like a Texan. I like Texas and Texans, he used to say. In Texas, everything is bigger. When Texans win, they win big. And when they lose, it's spectacular. They like losing, I asked. 
That's not what I'm saying. Nobody likes losing. Show me a happy loser, and I'll show you a loser, said Rich Dad. It's a Texan's attitude toward risk, reward, and failure I'm talking about. It's how they handle life. They live it big. Not like most of the people around here, living like roaches when it comes to money, terrified that someone will shine a light on them and whimpering when the grocery clerk shortchanges them a quarter. Rich Dad went on. What I like best is the Texas attitude. They're proud when they win, and they brag when they lose. Texans have a saying, if you're going to go broke, go big. You don't want to admit you went broke over a duplex. He constantly told Mike and me that the greatest reason for lack of financial success was because most people played it too safe. People are so afraid of losing that they lose, were his words. Fran Tarkenton, a one-time great NFL quarterback, says it still another way. Winning means being unafraid to lose. In my own life, I've noticed that winning usually follows losing. Before I finally learned to ride a bike, I first fell down many times. I've never met a golfer who has never lost a golf ball. I've never met people who have fallen in love who have never had their heart broken. And I've never met someone rich who has never lost money. So, for most people, the reason they don't win financially is because the pain of losing money is far greater than the joy of being rich. Another saying in Texas is, everyone wants to go to heaven, but no one wants to die. Most people dream of being rich, but are terrified of losing money, so they never get to heaven. Rich Dad used to tell Mike and me stories about his trips to Texas. If you really want to learn the attitude of how to handle risk, losing, and failure, go to San Antonio and visit the Alamo. The Alamo is a great story of brave people who chose to fight knowing there was no hope of success. They chose to die instead of surrendering. It's an inspiring story worthy of study. Nonetheless, it's still a tragic military defeat. They got their butts kicked. So, how do Texans handle failure? They still shout, Remember the Alamo. Mike and I heard this story a lot. He always told us this story when he was about to go into a big deal and he was nervous. After he had done all his due diligence and it was time to put up or shut up, he told us this story. Every time he was afraid of making a mistake or losing money, he told us this story. It gave him strength, for it reminded him that he could always turn a financial loss into a financial win. Rich Dad knew that failure would only make him stronger and smarter. It's not that he wanted to lose. He just knew who he was and how he would take a loss. He would take a loss and make it a win. That's what made him a winner and others losers. It gave him the courage to cross the line when others backed out. That's why I like Texans so much, he would say. They took a great failure and turned it into inspiration, as well as a tourist destination that makes them millions. But probably his words that mean the most to me today are these. Texans don't bury their failures. They get inspired by them. They take their failures and turn them into rallying cries. Failure inspires Texans to become winners. But that formula is not just the formula for Texans. It is the formula for all winners. I've said that falling off my bike was part of learning to ride. I remember falling off only made me more determined to learn to ride, not less. I also said that I have never met a golfer who has never lost a ball. For top professional golfers, losing a ball or a tournament provides the inspiration to be better, to practice harder, to study more. That's what makes them better. For winners, losing inspires them. For losers, losing defeats them. I like to quote John D. Rockefeller who said, I always tried to turn every disaster into an opportunity. And being Japanese American, I can say this. Many people say that Pearl Harbor was an American mistake. I say it was a Japanese mistake. 
From the movie Tora Tora Tora, a somber Japanese admiral says to his cheering subordinates, I am afraid we have awakened a sleeping giant. Remember Pearl Harbor became a rallying cry. It turned one of America's greatest losses into the reason to win. This great defeat gave America strength, and America soon emerged as a world power. Failure inspires winners, and failure defeats losers. It is the biggest secret of winners. It's the secret that losers do not know. The greatest secret of winners is that failure inspires winning. Thus, they're not afraid of losing. Repeating Fran Tarkenton's quote, winning means being unafraid to lose. People like Fran Tarkenton are not afraid of losing because they know who they are. They hate losing, so they know that losing will only inspire them to become better. There is a big difference between hating losing and being afraid to lose. Most people are so afraid of losing money that they lose. They go broke over a duplex. Financially, they play life too safe and too small. They buy big houses and big cars, but not big investments. The main reason that over 90% of the American public struggles financially is because they play not to lose. They don't play to win. They go to their financial planners or accountants or stockbrokers and buy a balanced portfolio. Most have lots of cash and CDs, low-yield bonds, mutual funds that can be traded within a mutual fund family, and a few individual stocks. It is a safe and sensible portfolio, but it is not a winning portfolio. It is a portfolio of someone playing not to lose. Don't get me wrong, it's probably a better portfolio than more than 70% of the population has, and that's frightening. It's a great portfolio for someone who loves safety. But playing it safe and balanced on your investment portfolio is not the way successful investors play the game. If you have little money and you want to be rich, you must first be focused, not balanced. If you look at any successful person, at the start, they were not balanced. Balanced people go nowhere. They stay in one spot. To make progress, you must first go unbalanced. Just look at how you make progress walking. Thomas Edison was not balanced. He was focused. Bill Gates was not balanced. He was focused. Donald Trump is focused. George Soros is focused. George Patton did not take his tanks wide. He focused them and blew through the weak spots in the German line. The French went wide with the Maginot line. And you know what happened to them. If you have any desire to be rich, you must focus. Do not do what poor and middle-class people do. Put their few eggs in many baskets. Put a lot of your eggs in a few baskets and focus. Follow one course until successful. If you hate losing, play it safe. If losing makes you weak, play it safe. Go with balanced investments. If you are over 25 years old and are terrified of taking risks, don't change. Play it safe, but start early. Start accumulating your nest egg early because it will take time. But if you have dreams of freedom, of getting out of the rat race, the first question to ask yourself is, how do I respond to failure? If failure inspires you to win, maybe you should go for it, but only maybe. If failure makes you weak or causes you to throw temper tantrums, like spoiled brats who call attorneys to file lawsuits every time something doesn't go their way, then play it safe. Keep your daytime job or buy bonds or mutual funds. But remember, there is risk in those financial instruments also, even though they may appear safe. I say all this, mentioning Texas and Fran Tarkenton, because stacking the asset column is easy. It's really a low-aptitude game. It doesn't take much education. Fifth-grade math will do, but building your asset column is a game in which attitude plays a major role. It takes guts, patience, and a great attitude toward failure. Losers avoid failing, and failure turns losers into winners. Just remember... The Alamo. Overcoming Cynicism. 
The sky is falling. The sky is falling. Most of us know the story of Chicken Little who ran around warning the barnyard of impending doom. We all know people who are that way. There's a Chicken Little inside each of us. As I stated earlier, the cynic is really a little chicken. We all get a little chicken when fear and doubt cloud our thoughts. All of us have doubts. I'm not smart. I'm not good enough. So-and-so is better than me. Our doubts often paralyze us. We play the what-if game. What if the economy crashes right after I invest? What if I lose control and I can't pay the money back? What if things don't go as I planned? Or we have friends or loved ones who will remind us of our shortcomings. They often say, what makes you think you can do that? If it's such a good idea, how come someone else hasn't done it? That will never work. You don't know what you're talking about. These words of doubt often get so loud that we fail to act. A horrible feeling builds in our stomach. Sometimes we can't sleep. We fail to move forward. So we stay with what is safe and opportunities pass us by. We watch life passing by as we sit immobilized with a cold knot in our body. We have all felt this at one time in our lives, some more than others. Peter Lynch of Fidelity Magellan Mutual Fund fame refers to warnings about the sky falling as noise, and we all hear it. Noise is either created inside our heads or comes from outside, often from friends, family, co-workers, and the media. Lynch recalls the time during the 1950s when the threat of nuclear war was so prevalent in the news that people began building fallout shelters and storing food and water. If they had invested that money wisely in the market, instead of building a fallout shelter, they'd probably be financially independent today. When violence breaks out in a city, gun sales go up all over the country. A person dies from rare hamburger meat in the state of Washington, and the Arizona Health Department orders restaurants to have all beef cooked well done. A drug company runs a TV commercial in February showing people catching the flu. Colds go up as well as sales of cold medicine. Most people are poor because when it comes to investing, the world is filled with chicken littles running around yelling, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. And chicken littles are effective because every one of us is a little chicken. It often takes great courage to not let rumors and talk of doom and gloom affect your doubts and fears. But a savvy investor knows that the seemingly worst of times is actually the best of times to make money. When everyone else is too afraid to act, they pull the trigger and are rewarded. Some time ago, a friend named Richard came from Boston to visit Kim and me in Phoenix. He was impressed with what we had done through stocks and real estate. The Phoenix real estate prices were depressed. We spent two days showing him what we thought were excellent opportunities for cash flow and capital appreciation. Kim and I are not real estate agents. We are strictly investors. After identifying a unit in a resort community, we called an agent who sold it to him that afternoon. The price was a mere $42,000 for a two-bedroom townhome. Similar units were going for $65,000. He had found a bargain. Excited, he bought it and returned to Boston. Two weeks later, the agent called to say that our friend had backed out. I called immediately to find out why. All he said was that he talked to his neighbor, and his neighbor told him it was a bad deal. 